Last week, I introduced the EPX project by testing a few different types of power supplies on an EPS derailleur. If you thought that was the end of it, you're sorely mistaken because this week we take it one step further and we're testing under load. When a company builds a new product, there is an awful lot of benchmarking that generally happens, testing all sorts of various subsystems and refining each of them until they're happy. We're starting with a known quantity here. We have a derailleur. We know its performance characteristics. We're only adjusting a few of those things. But those things that we can adjust are mainly the power subsystem or power supply, the electronics, which we're making from scratch, and algorithms embedded in the firmware, basically our control algorithms. How does one go about benchmarking something like this? Well, last week I showed the introduction of an oscilloscope measuring some of the electrical qualities, and that's good, but it's a bit clunky and slow in order to do hundreds of measurements. And it's very difficult to do longer measurements. At this stage, I really didn't feel that there was any benefit in building a data logger for this. So I turned to something simpler. I turned to high-speed video. The camera I'm shooting on now, as well as some of the GoPros I have, are all capable of at least 240 frames a second at full HD. And while I didn't use the GoPro footage very much, this main camera, uh, especially with its larger sensor, was able to capture very fine detail, which enabled me to do some timing analysis. Using the high-speed footage, I was able to benchmark my own personal main bike, which probably gets a few thousand kilometers a year, and has about a five or six year old EPS V3. It's an 11 speed. Uh, I don't currently have access to any 12 speed equipment, so I can't benchmark any of that. In addition to the video analysis, I was able to also capture oscilloscope data for several other power sources. That included my linear power supply, the boost you saw in last week's episode, a battery pack that is pretty close to what Campagnolo is using in their new EPS V4 system, but honestly, probably a bit underperformant, and a wild card. Uh, we'll get to that wild card a bit later. What I did was capture the 240 frame a second video of the derailleur under load, and that load is about 200 watts for whatever gear I was in. Then I painstakingly went through the video footage and tried to figure out when the derailleur started moving and when it stopped. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about this is that there is likely power applied for a few milliseconds before we see movement. That initial acceleration is where the greatest current is and we basically don't see. In some of the video footage, you can kind of see the derailleur like tighten up for a frame or two. And it's pretty tough to kind of discern what is just general derailleur movement caused by the gear shift and just how things mesh and what was actually derailleur movement caused by the actuator. Most of the video footage looks generally the same. And so there's not really much to show. Um, one of the unfortunate side effects of using my camera equipment to actually be involved in the analysis means I didn't film any of it. So you'll have to bear with me a little on that. With that, let's jump to some of these results. Looking at the time to shift up with lower being better, we can set our baseline with my original bike. The 12 volt power supply then comes in and it shows a bit better performance, but not always. The new pack, however, shows a general decrease in performance. The boost is right there with the old pack and the power supply. The trend is generally the same for downshift time as well. Setting our baseline with our old power unit, the 12.6 volt power supply kind of beats it out most of the time. And the, the new pack is just generally in there a bit slower at the lower gears. Our boost fits right in between the original pack and the 12.6 volt power supply. Another way to look at this is if we summed up the total time. The old power unit sets our baseline in around 600 milliseconds up and down, while the power supply just narrowly 
beats that out. The new pack, well, that starts falling behind by a measurable margin. And the boost is right in between the old and the new almost. It's just a, a little bit shy of the old. So just like before using the oscilloscope, um, the only difference this time, the oscilloscope was on the floor, really. Uh, we were able to look at the individual performance. Now, with the new pack, this is the waveform we get for both current and voltage, and you can clearly see when the shift occurs in there. You can clearly see this massive voltage sag with the boost, but it actually completes the shift faster. And let's just do a little side-by-side -side investigation here. We're zoomed in to just the shift, so you can see that the pack voltage drops a little bit, but not much. And then when the shift is complete, it jumps back up. Whereas the boost drops heavily, but its voltage is generally higher. The current draw is fairly flat with the battery, but with the boost, it's a little more wobbly. And as a result of the higher voltage spinning faster, and it gets to complete that shift earlier. Basically went and I did this same analysis for three upshifts and three downshifts, mainly because the, the top end I wasn't sure about. Um, and we set our baseline, just like we always do. The 12.6 volt EPSU is pretty close to my original Amanda, and that similar pack, well, it falls behind. The boost is very, very close. High-speed footage was also used for a complete the set sweep by holding the derailleur shift button and just waiting for it to complete all the shifts. What you'll see is that the boost is slightly, ever so slightly ahead of the new pack, which we know was underperforming. And there is a little less variance with the boost, but nothing significant. This is kind of similar to the downshift results, where there is a bit more variance in the new pack, but it sometimes gets ahead of the boost. The boost average is slightly faster. What's interesting to note about this is that it likely means that the dwell time, at the time at which the derailleur hovers over a gear as it shifts, is a more important factor for this number. When I was done testing, I was about to pack up everything and I thought to myself, I think I have some really small lithium cells. They'd be no good on their own in the boost circuit, but what if I put them in series to get the 3S configuration that is found in a normal power unit? And I thought, this probably isn't going to pan out. Those cells are these. These little tiny 230 milliamp hour cells are only a third to a quarter the capacity of those 14500 cells that are currently found in the, in the version 4 power unit. But they've got a trick up their sleeve. When you compare them to another cell, this is 1500 milliamp hours, but it's just a little bit bigger than twice, maybe two and a half times as big as this. Why is there such a capacity disparity, at least from an, a density perspective? Well, they're trading capacity for current. This little cell is good for a 30C continuous rating. Given it's about 0.2 amp hours, that means you can continuously draw six amps from this. That means it's only designed to last a few minutes. Not only that, usually their burst capacity or their pulsed capacity is usually two, sometimes three, but usually two times higher than that. That means I could draw six amps continuously from the cell or 12 amps in bursts while still maintaining an average of about six amps. I didn't really realize that when I had this, I just was looking for some small capacity batteries. Not only that, these are actually lithium high voltage, which means their charge voltage is actually 4.35 volts instead of 4.2. So that gives us with three in series, that gives us almost half a volt extra, which starts to explain what I started seeing when I did try them in a 3S configuration. So on the upshift time, we're eking out a little bit of a win all across the board. The low, last few gears are definite wins. Similar with 
downshift. The last few gears are, are a clear win here. So when we combine all those times, it's pretty obvious that these little tiny crazed pony quadcopter packs are a clear winner. And it's the same story when we look at the oscilloscope, just clear wins across the board, even compared to our 12.6 volt power supply. And this is the first time we're starting to see a real difference on the whole cassette upshifts and downshifts. Downshifts are noticeably faster with this little tiny pack. A little recap and some of my thoughts moving forward with EPX. What I found kind of interesting was that my maybe five plus year old EPS system basically has very amazing performance um, compared to a linear regulated power supply that can provide three amps. And we saw that the motors don't pull more than three amps, so it's just cable losses. That was pretty impressive, but how did I get a broken V3? Well, imbalance of a battery led to one cell just failing. And that's not very good. We also saw that trying to use any old 14500 cells in a pack, your mileage may vary. So while there is a potential road for ripping these power units apart and putting in a different pack, you could genuinely be leaving meaningful performance on the table. It, it could be basically like you're running at half a charge and performance decreases over the battery charge. That's certainly something that was easily quantifiable. We didn't go into that, but yeah, drop the voltage, derailleur goes slower. That leads us to the boost. The boost did pretty well with these big 18650 cells, but do I want to put a big 18650 on it? I'm not sure. Um, the boost circuit required some really big electrolytic caps. I can go more expensive and get smaller ones, but also uh, a lot of the 1S protection circuits in, they need giant MOSFETs to handle that high peak current. So there's some trade-offs with that. With the Craze Pony cells, I'm genuinely not sure. These look like a great option, but lithium high voltage is really not that common for everyday applications. And you're certainly going to trade off high current drain against capacity for the same size. So it might be a good solution, um, but I, I'm not sure. It, it is kind of attractive because it gives us that little bit of extra voltage, which means we could get a little bit of extra performance out of it. And especially with aging derailleurs where everyone's trying to make new and better and faster, that might give an extra bit of life to reusing these derailleurs in the EPX type adapter, configuration, kit, whatever it is. It also led me down the road of really looking at chargers and I struggled to find anything until I actually watched a teardown by Gamer Nexus of the Steam Deck, the soon to be released handheld device for basically on the go PC gaming. And they literally read off the chip. Well, this is one of the sister chips and it is, pretty impressive for a charger. So it would make charging very simple. Uh, I also found out that you can do a proper USB-C PD and negotiate voltage um, with just a few lines of script wired to that charge circuit. However, it feels a little meaningless. In fact, um, I, I've learned that most adapters, USB-C adapters are not properly PD compliant because of this. They're, they fail to enumerate properly and they're just five volt adapters. And considering that we're only ever worst case charging at 10 to 15 watts, if I was to make a microcharge too, we're really only trying to look at six or 700 milliamps at the 12 volts, which is in and around 10 watts. And that is five volt capable. So we can pull 15 watts from most of these three amp five volt chargers, which are getting pretty common. And you can get away without having to use all the USB-C negotiation with those. But not only that, they've made these chips so smart because of that lack of compliance, they can detect voltage sags and automatically decrease current. So if you plug it into an adapter that is not capable, these guys are now smart enough 
to deal with that and just drop your charge current, which was not something that it really existed when I designed the original microcharge. So this adds a real potential benefit. And not only that, all the parts to build one of these, all the, all the ICs and supporting components is actually cheaper than all the parts for the previous microcharge. So yeah, you give something four or five years and, and you can get some much better tech out of it, especially when there is consumer demand. Right now, I feel a little bit like maybe looking at making a microcharge two using this max chip and making it via an adapter so it can charge a battery I design that is kind of removable like SRAM ETAP axis. So what I think I'm looking at doing is, is giving the 3S configuration a, another serious shot. There's better charging solutions out there. USB-C is infinitely better than micro USB, even if the compliance is absolutely terrible. Chips are smart enough to deal with that now, which is amazing. But there's actually a real performance benefit here for using those lithium high voltage cells or even a high current lithium polymer cell and maybe making a removable battery so that you don't have to charge on bike. Um, I, I think as much as I don't like having multiple batteries on a bike, I think I like removable batteries better. Hopefully you learned a little bit about what I'm thinking on doing, but also I'm kind of interested in going back and using that same video analysis technique to benchmark other group sets. I mean, this is something that, that the big three group set manufacturers, they do. If someone launches a new group set, they immediately buy it and they benchmark it. Um, but no one ever talks about or makes those benchmarks public. So I have a DI2 system here, the, the previous wired generation. So, you know, more reliable shifting. Um, and I have a couple of mechanical group sets kicking around as well as I have friends with other various mechanical group sets. So it might be neat to take those and benchmark them and to get a feel of, of what are you losing or what are you gaining with each group set. And I have all this other video footage from the EPS system, from all these various power supplies. So we get to know pretty quickly where each group set lands. So with that, keep tuned. I think uh, I've thrown enough money towards dev kits now that I guess I'm a little more committed to this with, I've technically bought three dev kits. So uh, I guess this project is going to continue. So uh, look forward to some new videos on this stuff. And uh, there's a mix of some weird things coming too. Take care.